guys, what is going on? I want to give you a little story time here. I'm out walking Goro. It's pretty late at night. <laughs> Sorry, this is Agar. Uh, Goro is my pit bull that passed away. But anyhow, I want to tell you how a crackhead saved the day. But he saved the day for me because there was some information and things that I really needed to know. And uh, I come to find out what was going on. So let me just get right into the story. So I'm going to edit certain parts of this just for privacy and whatnot. But uh, I was helping out working um, in a very bad city. It's in one of the top 10 highest crime cities in the United States. And when I get into the story, please just stay with me. I'm going to tell you some other things that's going to blow your mind if you've never been in a city like this and how things are done, how much differently things are done. It's almost like going into a third world country. So I was working with the blank MHA police. for Metropolitan Housing Authority. There's several of these all over the country. And uh, the police force is there because the cities are so large that they have to have their own unit uh, to go in. So there's several buildings where people live. These buildings are old, dilapidated. They're filled from top to bottom with nothing but bed bugs. Bed bugs everywhere, bed bug traps everywhere, and it don't work. They're very old, run down, and this is how they stay. So, um, I had a couple of tours through these buildings. I, I no way knew these buildings like the back of my hand or anything like that. Uh, I didn't have a uh, grasp of these buildings real well on the layouts. Semi, but just not a lot. So, at one of these buildings, I believe it was about 3 a.m. A fire alarm starts going off. Now, <laughs> this is probably something that'll blow your mind. You're probably gonna say, I've never heard of this. It's so bad up there. And these uh, metropolitan housing uh, buildings. Let me, let, let me back up here first and give you a little bit more information. Who lives in these metropolitan housing authority buildings? X long-term prisoners that get out and have no family and nowhere to go. People that are fresh out of drug rehab with nowhere to go. And the mentally or somewhat sometimes criminally insane that are let go. And people with mental illness, severe mental illness. That's what lives in these buildings. Big buildings. Some of them go up to 23 stories. Some of them not so much. Some of them there's building side by side. But anyhow, let me get back to the story. So at about 3 in the morning, I'm riding up by this one building. And I hear, the, I hear a fire alarm blazing from down the street. This particular building is seven stories high. And it's 3 in the morning. This building is full, completely full of people. Seven stories high. And probably a quarter mile long hallways filled room to room to room to room next to each other with people. There's three people that came out when this fire alarm was going off. That's it, three. That's all. Everybody else was in there. They were just sleeping. I could hear it from down the street. I could hear this fire alarm. I'm going to get to another part of this that's going to blow your mind on the fire department's policy up there where this is at. It's going to blow your mind. You're probably not going to believe this could happen and it does <laughs> that it could be this way but it is the fire department's policy is because there's so many false alarms and the area is so bad they will not come out to a fire alarm call until officers go and confirm that there's an actual fire first and then escort them through the building so I get up to the building, there's a resident crackhead, 
probably was probably been smoking since the 90s he's older now but he's still a smoker you know always tweaking always outside knows all the business knows everything of what's going on so i pull up there to this building with the fire alarm blazing it's just me mind you i don't have a good layout of these buildings and i gotta go in and i gotta clear this building for a fire either there's a fire and the department can come or there's not a fire and it's stopped and they don't come. So, this crackhead that's always tweaking, always out and about, he says, hey man, I'll help you out. You know, I've seen him a couple of times around there. He's always out. He says, hey man, I'll help you out. I'll help you out, man. I know where they pull these false alarms, kids and stuff, and I can take you and show you where the panels and stuff are for this fire alarm. I was like, oh man, sweet, because I knew this guy. He's up in everybody's business, even though he's a crackhead. And it's just one of those dudes. So sure enough, we go into the building and uh, getting into this uh, elevator. And this building's so old that the elevator has wood paneling on the bottom level of it. Wood paneling with old brass lighting up on top. This stuff's all original. And I'm like, man, I really don't, I'm thinking, you know, I really don't want to, I don't even know if I want to take this up. You know, am I going to get stuck in here or what? You know, if I don't know what's going on. I can't get stuck. So I get in there and the door closes and he goes, all right, we'll be cool. I said, what are you talking about? He goes, well, if the door does a certain thing, the elevator's going to get stuck on you. And um, if it makes a pop and sticks, he goes, it didn't do that. So it, it, we'll make it up. As we're going up the elevator, I kid you not, I look at the panel on the elevator where the buttons are, and the emergency call button is completely gone, ripped out. There's a hole there. And when I look in this hole, I can see green and some different color wires back in there. And I said, what in the world? And I said, he said, what? And I put my finger in that hole uh, on the panel. Where, the, uh, emer where it says emergency call, if you get stuck. He said they was pushing that button so much in here, that emergency call button, when they didn't need to, just to do it, just for something to do. And he said the fire department and them came out and they ripped the button out of the panel. I find that hard to believe, right? But also I would find hard to believe that the fire department won't come until you confirm a fire. So anything's possible. So sure enough, he takes me up into this place. It's kind of on the one end of the building. Sure enough, the fire alarms popped and then shows me where the panel's at. We get all that taken care of, back and forth on the radio. This guy really, I mean, this dude helped everything. It was like having my own guided tour guy in there, right? Where I'd have been going in, going, walking every stitch of that building, looking for what is going on. So he's like, hey man, hey man, can I just get a couple dollars, man? I wanna get a pack of cigarettes. I just got a couple dollars. I was like, dude, I said, man, you helped me so much in here. Get this taken care of. I said, this alarm, I couldn't even hear. Um, I was taking, I took wads of uh, toilet paper out of the bathroom and put them on my ears. I couldn't even hear in there. We're using sign language. Me and, me and his crackheads in this building use the sign language. <laughs> uh, so when I got it turned off and I could hear again, I was like, oh my goodness. You know, after hearing it so long, I said, I just tap, I never carry cash ever. Just happened to be that uh, I had had a $20 bill and I bought something before work, I think a Powerade or a Gatorade, and I had $15 in my pocket. I said, dude, I said, this is probably the best money I ever spent. I gave him 15 bucks. I said, I said, you did help me. Uh, more than I could have asked for and uh, I said uh, this is the least I can do man is give you a reward for helping me you know I said and that's what this is I said I'm not going to consider this pandering or vagrancy or whatever I said you help me with this and I'm going to give you the, I'm going to give you $15 so he was lit up like a Christmas tree you know so <laughs> there's more to this story so just hang with me Later on, everything's cleared. Uh, some more cars arrive. We're talking and whatnot. I go around and go to the front of the building. 
in the front of the building, you got the main street out here, and you got a loop, like a like a horseshoe loop where a car can come up close to the doors and then pull back out on the street to drop people off. I go out the front doors, that crackhead is waist deep in the passenger side of a car um, in there toward the driver. And guess what he's doing? <laughs> he's buying some crack with the money he just got. Now, I didn't physically see the transaction and I didn't physically see the crack, but when he came out from being waist deep inside this car, put his right hand that was folded up into his pocket and then turned around and I was like, what's going on, man? He was like, oh, oh, uh, nothing, man, nothing, nothing, man. And I just, <laughs> dude's tweaking and everything else. I just basically looked at the dude. I said, man, just go inside, man. Don't let me see you out here anymore tonight. I pretty much knew what he had done. Um, I didn't physically see anything. So technically would have been a violation of rights to um, go searching somebody down you know that I just because it's a bad town and he's a crack smoker and he came out of his car and put his hand in his pocket does that mean that I could go to Beverly Hills and do that to some woman that's reaching into a car and comes out would I be able to then take her and search her no right that wouldn't last very long right so I apply those same rules up there even though I know what he did but he helped me uh, big time and uh, I told him I said man just don't let me see you out here again go back inside oh yes sir yes sir yes sir I'm going inside right now I won't come back out at all till tomorrow morning I won't come out okay let me know so let me know what you think about that that is a true story of what happened, a crackhead saved the day. It helped me uh, immensely. This guy knew where uh, they pull, for whatever reason, pull the fire alarm just to get things stirred up and just to, just for no other reason than just to cause trouble. He knew exactly where that was gonna be at and showed me uh, where it had happened. Uh, so, that help was probably the best $15 I've ever spent. And I honestly feel like I did owe him something for uh, helping me. I mean, when you go into a building and the alarms are blaring where you can hear down the street, you can't be on the phone. I couldn't have talked to somebody on the phone. My eardrums were ringing. It was like gunfire going off by my ears. I went in the bathroom, took wads of TP, put them in my ears. Asked the crackhead if he wanted some, which he denied. He shook his head, no, no, no. <laughs> I'm in this building with my head ringing and I would have had to have walked every inch of this building until I found up on the upper floors what was going on. <coughs> so that's the story of what happened. I've got some more stories. If you guys find this one interesting, I'll tell you some more. It's a different world. It's one of the most exciting things I've ever done. And it's also one of the most on edge things you'll feel that you've ever done if you were to do this. And you'll go back to your hometown like I did and you'll be in your hometown's bad part of town and it'll feel like a walk in the park compared to what was going on uh, there where I was at, at the government owned metropolitan housing. What I described to people was, it was like being in a prison without the bars. You had people with severe mental illness. You had people that were criminally insane that were let out. You had people from uh, drug rehabilitation that had nowhere to go. They didn't have a dime or a shirt on their back and ended up there. And then you have long-term to uh, very long-term prisoners that got out of prison and they've just got nowhere to go and they've got no family or anybody in the world. And that's where they put them at is in there. So, um, yeah, it's, it, it, it gave me a new perspective on some things. I had never dealt with anything like that uh, before, and it will give you a new perspective. It was a lot of um, 
that was a lot of good training. Uh, I believe it helped me in several ways um, with what I do. It, it just, it gave me new perspective and just dealing with people uh, that's in that situation that are hard to deal with, it makes the average person that you deal with seem so much easier, like a cakewalk. So it was a very good experience in that sense. Um, and there may come a time when I do this again. This was in the middle of summertime when they just when they can't when there's just so much going on they can't keep up with it. Is when I went to help on the side. Uh, they just couldn't keep up with it. Um, it may happen again. Um, and if I do, maybe I'll take some videos of that time. All right, guys, I hope everybody stays safe out there. Me and Agar, we're going to walk around for a while and head back to the truck and drive on out of here. DOF. And I'm out.